Welcome to today's program titled Special Delivery Unwelcome Outreach from the Government, Part 2, Immigration Discrimination, Department of Justice, Return to Sender, Please. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and is requi required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program, Angelo Paparelli. Angelo, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm uh, delighted to present with uh, two uh, all-stars in this field. Um, I, I uh, am uh, a partner at CIFARTH in the Immigration Practice Group, practicing out of downtown Los Angeles, and I've been at this business for quite a while and certainly can offer a thought or two on the subject of today's conference. I also welcome Dawn Lurie, uh, who is in our Washington, D.C. office. Dawn is on the Verification Committee of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and she has been on it for a, quite a long time. Uh, that agency, or that uh, liaison committee, interacts with uh, the uh, immigrant and employee rights section on a regular basis, and she also has years and years of practice experience defending employers in uh, this area. Uh, Leon Rodriguez, out of our Washington, D.C. office as well, is the former director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services within the Department of Homeland Security. He also served for two years as Deputy Assistant Attorney General over the Immigrant and Employee Rights unit within the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division, and so he brings a wealth of experience both in the agency, in the government, and uh, now in private practice for several years. So with that, um, let's move on to our session. As you see, we are going to break this up into four uh, agenda items, and uh, we'll start with an introductory section on what exactly is the Immigrant and Employee Rights Section of the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Department Division. Uh, so next slide, please. And the one after that, please. Turn it over to Leon. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to talk this afternoon uh, about the Immigrant and Employee Rights Section in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. Uh, and it is a uh, part of the Department of Justice uh, that enforces only one law, uh, which is uh, a portion, an anti-discrimination section of the Immigration Reform and Control Act under 8 United States Code, Section 1324B. Uh, just to give you a sense of, of how important IER is within uh, the Department of Justice, at the time that it was created back in 1986, uh, Congress uh, made the decision to make its chief a political appointee, uh, making that section unlike any other section chief anywhere else in the Department of Justice. Um, and, and so in terms of what IER views as its mission, uh, in fact, it's a mission that extends somewhat beyond uh, the strict requirements of 8 U.S.C. 1324B. Uh, and as you will see in some of the discussions that they will, uh, we will have today, uh, they view their mission uh, not only to prevent discrimination under this statute, uh, but also to really do everything they can to eliminate uh, either discriminatory uh, or otherwise irrational barriers uh, to work authorized uh, individuals being able uh, to be hired into employment in the United States. Next slide, please. Um, so the first thing that the uh, law that IER enforces, 8 U.S.C. 1324B, uh, uh, prohibits uh, is citizenship status discrimination. 
uh, and it is citizenship discrimination status uh, in certain specific phases of the employment relationship between an employee and an employer. Uh, and that is during the hiring, uh, uh, firing, uh, and or the recruitment or referral uh, for a fee by employers. Now, again, it's limited to only those employers with four or more employees. Uh, citizenship status uh, extends just beyond United States citizen uh, and includes uh, certain categories of a person's immigration status. And so we talk about citizenship discrimination status as it affects uh, what, what are, are labeled as protected individuals under 8 U.S.C. 1324B. Those can include U.S. citizens, um, non-citizen nationals, which is a narrow but important category uh, of uh, immigration, um, uh, immigration status, asylees, not asylum seekers, asylees, and refugees. And again, not refugee applicants, but actual refugees. Uh, and then recent law for permanent residents, uh, a, a category uh, um, basically uh, within a certain period of time after they become uh, lawful permanent residents, um, um, but no longer than a certain period of time after they become eligible to apply for U.S. citizen. Uh, here you have it uh, within six months of their eligibility to apply for um, uh, citizenship. Uh, employers may restrict hiring to a U.S. citizen only uh, if there is a law, regulation, executive order, uh, or government contract that requires the employer to do so. Next slide, please. Uh, discriminate um, un under 8 U.S.C. 1324B means the act of treating uh, an individual intentionally differently from other individuals because of either their national origin, we're going to talk about national origin a little bit uh, down the line, uh, or citizenship status, regardless of the reason uh, for which that differential treatment uh, is being imposed. Uh, so there does not need to be uh, either animus or hostility toward the person or their particular immigration status. Uh, if, in fact, uh, there is a, an unjustified differentiation on that basis, uh, that is actionable under 8 U.S.C. 1324B. Next slide, please. Um, under the law that IER enforces, uh, what are called unfair documentary practices are considered a kind of citizenship status uh, discrimination under the first section uh, that we mentioned. Uh, and, and these are unfair discriminatory practices in the process of verifying the employment eligibility of employees. So this refers specifically uh, to uh, the manner in which documents are acquired and inspected in the context of both the Form I-9 uh, and E-Verify uh, processes. Uh, so among the things that are actionable, and you'll be hearing a bit more detail about this uh, later, uh, actionable under this section of 18, uh, USC 1324B are requesting more documents than the minimum required uh, to comply with Form I-9. Uh, specifying specific documents, uh, notwithstanding the fact that a, a, a new uh, employee may have choice, uh, choices among various documents uh, from the list of uh, lists of acceptable documents. Um, uh, only um, intentional discrimination uh, is actionable uh, in this situation. Uh, liability for unfair disc uh, just documentary practice can only arise if the employer's request for more documents or refusal to honor tender documents is made for the purpose of or with the intent of discriminating against an individual on the basis of uh, national origin or citizenship status. But again, keep in mind here uh, that it doesn't need, doesn't need to be made uh, based on any kind of prejudice uh, or animus. It is just the intent to treat the individual differently uh, because of that immigration status uh, that triggers this section. A very large portion of the cases that we see here, and we'll discuss this later, uh, are based on this section. Next, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, as with, uh, like many other uh, anti-discrimination status uh, that the participants on this conversation uh, may have encountered uh, in their work, uh, there is a retaliation and intimidation 
uh, prohibition contained within uh, this statute as well. Uh, and under this one, the employer, the size of the employer does not matter. Uh, they are not allowed to intimidate, threaten, or coerce or retaliate against individuals for filing charges with IER, uh, cooperating with an IER in, uh, investigation, opposing action within their employer uh, or, to, or, or in, in, with respect to their employer that may constitute unfair documentary practices or discrimination based on citizenship status or national origin, uh, or otherwise asserting their rights uh, under the Immigration Reform Control Act uh, anti-discrimination provision. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, and so here, uh, now sort of um, uh, putting a little bit more meat on the bones and uh, illustrating some of the scenarios uh, in, in which the kind of discrimination that's prohibited under 1324B may occur, uh, we have examples under each category. Now, I, didn't, I, I really didn't uh, dig into what it means uh, to discriminate uh, based on national origin, um, but here we have an example, uh, uh, a few examples, and, and here citizenship status does not matter. Uh, rather, if there is any uh, conduct uh, that treats a person differently because of the country they are from, because they appear to be uh, from a different country. And, and Dawn, there's a hypothetical here, and maybe I might invite you to to expound on the kind of scenario that we might be talking about here. Yeah, so here Charlie walks in and he has a heavy accent, um, and uh, Mary, the HR person, um, starts to chat with him and you know, says, where are you from? Um, and that's based on his accent, right? So when we get into those types of issues, um, you know, red flag goes up. He says he's from Utopia. And um, she remembers what she's reading in the paper and she's really concerned um, about all the issues going on in Utopia. And she basically says, yeah, you know what, behind the scenes, we're not going to make an, an offer uh, to, uh, to Charlie. We're really concerned. Um, and um, again, and it's a little bit more, you know, maybe an in-depth uh, example, but all started with the fact that, you know, he has an accent and she's concerned um, about that. Don, if I can just add a clarification, sure. and that is that um, Section 1324B uh, has a limit in the scope of uh, national origin discrimination. And uh, so it only applies to employers of four to 14 employees. And so IER would not have jurisdiction for employers of 15 or more workers. That would go to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That's right, and that's why you know we see certain charges and where they're focusing on. And the majority of the um, the cases that we're going to see are going to be citizenship status and, and unfair documentary uh, practices coming out of that office right now. Um, I don't know if you want to go on. I mean, I, you know, we don't have to go through no. all of these examples, but um, you know, a lot of them we're just you know really trying to to, to illustrate. Um, you know, in, in the second example, we have Shree, he comes in, um, he gives his LPR card, and, um, you know, the the HR manager, and it looks like that example's got up, the HR manager says, well, you know what, um, I I see that uh, you're an LPR, but we'd actually like to have some some other documents. Um, and um, she, you know, she wants she wants something else. And, and sometimes we'll see it, um, uh, in the context of unfair documentary practices, um, but you know, generally here um, in this example, it's because he's, he's, he's yeah. Talking. Well, and that's an important point. You you may have uh, both both theories of discrimination right. in, in a situation. Um, you know, there are other situations uh, that I know we'll be talking about later, uh, where people are are excluded from employment, uh, not notwithstanding the fact that. Um, um, they are they are, are eligible and they are protected persons. Um, I think the remaining scenarios are uh, pretty self-explanatory, and participants will be able to review them when they see the deck after. So let's now uh, go on to the next uh, slide. I think it's a section slide, and so perhaps the next slide after that. Um, so now we get to uh, the tools that IER uh, uses uh, to enforce uh, these um, this this law, 
uh, those tools go uh, somewhat beyond uh, just ordinary uh, enforcement actions like the kinds you might see uh, from something like the EEOC, uh, and really a number of things that IER does in order to condition employer behavior uh, to really avoid situations where employee, uh, new hires uh, are denied employment because of their uh, citizenship status or national origin. And Dawn, I think you are the the absolute world expert on the IER hotline. Um, so I think uh, this is a good point to uh, to invite you to comment about that. Sure, sure. So um, I, I love the hotline. Um, I've been working with the IER attorneys for many years um, on behalf of individual clients and then groups of um, uh, clients that, that get um, you know more than their share uh, of IER uh, interventions. Um, but there are two hotlines, as you said. So one of them uh, is where um, employers can call in and can, can get advice. Um, one of the things that, that you should know is that you can actually call in and, and not necessarily identify uh, your, your company. So that's, that's one thing um, you, you can do. So you can have HR managers calling in um, or you can have, um, uh, well, anyone can, can call in, um, but there are there is a separate um, hotline for employees that you know feel that they that they have concerns. Um, a lot of the calls um, from from IR, in my experience, come from referrals from other agencies. So sometimes the not for profit um, organizations will suggest they have good relationships with IAR, and they'll suggest that employees call in and ask uh, for for their help. So IAR can clarify things. Um, and IER can also, um, through this hotline, they can take a look what the situation is. Sometimes it's a misunderstanding in what the employee thinks is happening and what is actually happening. Um, so it's a really nice kind of um, uh, preliminary review where they can, they, they can help. And I, and I know um, sometimes employers are, are hesitant um, of, of, you know, about or, or, or about, you know, immediately um, stress out you know, when, they, when they get a call. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, addressing, it is important to, you know, to, to address these um, in order to ensure that a charge isn't filed. But um, we have had great successes over the years in, in using um, uh, the, the hotline. Um, it's fully staffed and they have um, uh, everyone from interns to actual attorneys that are, um, uh, that, that, that actually um, will answer, will answer questions. Um, and Again, um, I think it's, it's important to be careful and take these, these calls very seriously. I don't know, Angela, if you had anything to add on that? Yes. Oh, no, I don't know if we want to get into questions right now as we go along or, or not. There is an interesting question that's come up, and I, I could address it briefly. Um, it, does it create issues for the employer if they chose not to consider a foreign national for a position because they are only authorized to work for a limited amount of time but are not requesting employer sponsorship? For example, 12 months of optional practical training, but what happens after optional practical training ends? Um, actually, I, I will be talking about technical assistance letters, and I sent a technical assistance letter query uh, to the predecessor agency. It, was used, it used to be called the Office of Special Counsel for Unfair Immigration-Related Employment Practices, and they said there is no violation of um, Section 1324B. Uh, if there is a legitimate business reason for the employer to say that they would not um, employ someone uh, if this information was volunteered. The problem is there is a prohibition against alienage discrimination in the employment laws enforced by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And uh, there have been cases in which, for example, DREAMers, DACA beneficiaries, have um, successfully sued for failure to hire, even though DACA beneficiaries don't need an employer sponsorship. And that was alienage discrimination, at least it made made a prima facie case. So we're not going to talk about Section 1981, but Angela, that's a, a great point, and maybe we have a separate webinar on that, but basically there can be private causes of action, and we've seen them in, in the DACA DREAMA space, and um, I don't think we've seen the end of it. So while IER may not be a, bring a charge, you may have individual employees um, that may bring a charge. So um, can we go to the next, char uh, the next slide? Angela, you want to start on TAL? Sure. 
<laughs> um, technical assistance letters are uh, actually quite helpful, and the agency over the course of its existence and the predecessor agency have issued a number of technical assistance letters where uh, questions can be posed as to what is the position of IER, and they have been forthcoming. Uh, the technical assistance letters are online at the IER website, and uh, they uh, are broken down by categories, so to some degree they can be helpful. Interestingly, uh, during the Trump administration, Jeff Sessions uh, disavowed several of the technical assistance letters uh, when he was the Attorney General, but a number of, of the better ones, which are really instructive on some obscure or esoteric points, are still there and still valid. Um, as uh, uh, the slide suggests, there are many different forms of outreach. Um, I would observe that the uh, uh, IER is one of, in, in my opinion, and others may differ, but in my opinion, it's one of the most assertive um, uh, federal enforcement agencies that enforce the immigration laws. Um, and uh, you can discern that by looking at the uh, regular press releases that announce settlements um, that the IER pose, posts on their website, uh, it seems like at least one a week. And those settlements, if you read the settlement agreements, can be quite onerous. We'll get into that. Um, IER also provides training materials. There are online webinars, um, and uh, those, those can be extremely helpful. Um, and those trainings are on a variety of topics. Next slide, please. Yeah, so let's talk and, about um, some of the other tools in the toolbox. Go ahead, Leon. No, no, I was going to invite Angela to talk, actually. I think uh, he has uh, okay. something to say about these interagency partnerships. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's, let, me, let me talk about that. The, the um, um, Biden administration, uh, uh, through the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, issued a memorandum making it very clear that a focus of the Biden administration will be on worksite enforcement and uh, avoidance of the exploitation of undocumented workers. Uh, those are uh, uh, interagency coordinated efforts uh, whereby they are backed by memoranda of understanding between and among several federal enforcement agencies, including the EEOC, the Department of Labor, uh, and, and uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Customs and Border Protection. Uh, these partnerships oftentimes serve as uh, forwarders of suspected violations based on the statutory jurisdiction of each agency. And so you can uh, have uh, one agency lead IER to file a claim on its own uh, using its self-directed uh, authority to investigate violations. There is also a practice that is acknowledged. If you look at the privacy impact statements uh, associated with E-Verify, it, it does acknowledge that that information on E-Verify, the database maintained by DHS uh, and comprised of DHS records and Social Security Administration records, is data mined by uh, IER. Uh, and, and for an example, uh, I'm aware of, of the practice of looking for what IER believes to be an unreasonable number of green card um, um, documents shown as the basis upon which to verify um, uh, uh, that the person is awfully authorized to work and the identity is verified. And even though, as we said earlier, disparate impact statistical analyses are not allowed under the statute, uh, IER will look at E-Verify data and uh, not so much to assert disparate impact, but to find out whether investigation should ensue as to disparate treatment or unfair documentary practices where documents are specified, such as a green card. 
Um, IER is also active in reviewing other agencies' policies so that the agencies uh, in the immigration bureaucracy are speaking with a consistent voice, uh, particularly uh, with respect to IER's own authority. And it uses a referral checklist um, that uh, um, and Dawn, you provided this. Is this something IER sends out or it receives? I think they create it in and it receives um, from, from other agencies. It helps other agencies in determining what should be referred to them. I see. So it's a solicitation of IER complaints. <laughs> you could call it that, sir. Next slide, please. Well, actually, before we go on, Angela, oh, I just, just sure. wanted to, because this, this is an important, you know, this is an important slide. Um, E-Verify uh, data mining, absolutely, you know, we've seen that. Um, other places that they data mine, um, job advertisements and job boards and things like that. So definitely, you know, they are, um, uh, the, the, the attorneys over at, um, at this office at DOJ, um, they are all, um, um, very focused and um, very interested in, in the work that they do. Um, I want to say all, but but the ones that, that we've been uh, working with over the years. So um, you know, something to consider. You know, they're not just you know they they don't approach their work with blinders on. So anything that's out in the public domain, um, easily accessible, definitely things that they are looking at. Um, in addition to the um, the partnerships, there's MOUs with the Department of State. There's um, MOUs between CIS, FDNS and um, uh, 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 the um, and, and IER. Um, so, you know, they're looking at things um, that um, could include visa programs and other things. Um, IER has a, you know, a broad range. We're looking at I-9s, we're looking at immigrant visas, non-immigrant visas, all types of things, and um, they definitely, um, they definitely use those relationships. I'm not sure how much, I, I get this question asked a lot, I'm not sure how many referrals go from IER to ICE, um, I'm, you know, I, I, I think uh, many of the, um, the attorneys there um, uh, don't necessarily, you know, refer that way, um, but definitely between CIS. And as far as the um, relationships between the agencies, um, once there are policy changes that are being made, um, they are definitely at the table. There's a good relationship between um, IER, between ICE, between CIS. Um, especially those folks at the verification division that um, own the E-Verify program. Um, IER has been at the table with the new I-9. Um, they've seen it, they review it, they comment on it, there's policy. So, you know, they're very much in the know. And, and they can also, you know, they, they can be helpful when, when things go wrong. Next slide. The meat of it. <laughs> As we are. Okay. So, the the... Sort of the, the the big show, if you will, um, not necessarily a, uh, the dominant part of everything that IER does, but certainly uh, the place where, uh, as a as an employer, uh, you really we really need to start talking about where risk may lie, uh, are on uh, complaint investigations. And actually, here it's important to distinguish uh, between complaint investigations or uh, an employee or an organization on behalf of an employee or multiple employees uh, file a charge uh, with the immigrant and employee rights section and independent investigations, which are those investigations that IER uh, originates by itself using uh, the various types of resources that you just heard uh, Dawn and Angelo uh, uh, discuss. And so who can file a charge? Uh, anyone who alleges they are a victim of discrimination or retaliation. Uh, or somebody who's been authorized uh, to file on behalf of that victim. Uh, there is a pretty tight statute of limitations, and I, and I have actually seen uh, complainants uh, cases founder uh, on this particular requirement as a 180-day statute uh, after the alleged discriminatory act. Uh, the individual must have actually filed uh, with IER by that point. Uh, IER may, uh, on its own, initiate an invest, uh, independent investigation. They can uh, send data requests. They can look at the kinds of sources we were talking about before. And in this case, they'll be looking at uh, broader practices by an employer uh, that may uh, be discriminatory, uh, potentially affect many employees or applicants. And, and this is a point where I do want to underscore, uh, you know, as somebody who's worked in, in, in multiple federal civil rights agencies, uh, that often uh, the civil rights agencies uh, not only want to uh, 
uh, enforce the, the four corners of the statutes uh, that are assigned to them, uh, but really want to use their authorities as a way of conditioning specific behaviors uh, by employers and other kinds of organizations uh, that, that in their view create a less discriminatory environment, whether in the workplace or other kinds of environments. Next, next slide, please. Uh, so just to give you an overview of the process, once IER has received uh, a charge, uh, they will notify uh, the affected employer, where they call them their respondents. Uh, along with that notification, typically, we've actually seen a couple of uh, uh, exceptions recently, uh, typically IER will issue a data request. Uh, asking uh, for documentation directly related to the charge uh, itself. Uh, it may, in the instance of an unfair documentary abuses practice, uh, include a request uh, for, for multiple uh, forms I-9. Uh, but the data request will then almost invariably be used by IER to look beyond the, the particular individual affected in the complaint uh, and look more broadly, or, and even the scenario, the, the kind of specific type of conduct in the complaint, uh, and look more broadly at that business's compliance uh, with the IRCA anti-discrimination provision. Uh, and so they will request uh, Forms I-9, they will request e-verified data, uh, they will request other data from the employer, really looking far more, you know, and, and more proactively uh, at their um, uh, compliance with, uh, with the law that they enforce. Um, it is possible uh, to negotiate both the scope and timing of the documentary response. Uh, every once in a while, these letters are way overboard. You may have a more junior lawyer who uh, uh, thinks my, this might be the big case. Uh, and they ask, uh, they ask for all kinds of stuff. But you know, at the end of the day, we're, we've always been able to negotiate reasonable scope and timing. Uh, a rolling production in the way you might in any other case uh, where you're uh, interacting uh, with uh, with the government. I saw that that sort of that knowing nod by Dawn, who's certainly been well, through through a bunch bunch of these. And, and, I, and I have. Uh, ahead, oh, I was going to just say I I've sort of seen these charges by individuals. I th I think of them as if you're sitting in a restaurant and the restaurant is a fancy one and they offer you what they call it a mousse bouche. Uh, whereby they tantalize the palate. This creates in IER a ravenous appetite for documents and information that are that are far flung and oftentimes um, arguably unrelated to the charge in question. Exactly, but they have expansive power, right? And and you have to be judicious in, and and this is I think you know from a, a strategic standpoint. There's no one size fits all response to IER, right? You have to look at who you're dealing with, what the ultimate goal is here, what's the risk um, uh, appetite on behalf of your client, um, what's your ultimate end goal. And the thing is, you know, these are, it, they're, they're, they move, these investigations, they move so quickly. And in, in some cases, you know what the issue is. In some cases, you don't. The other thing that we find very frequently in these investigations is when we're looking at something, we may look at one thing that they're, we think IER is focusing on, and then we may uncover something else, right? So you need to, we need to be careful about this. Um, I do think that recently, um, and I don't know necessarily if it's under, I, I think it, it doesn't matter of the administration, there has been more of a sense of, of empowerment and, um, you know, this is it's a very busy office. So yeah, go ahead, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, and, and this is a point where I, I do feel like uh, it's an important point because it, for, for, for even, even a lot of our colleagues in, in, in law practice, but also a lot of our clients, the first time they hear about IER is when one of these charges drops. And it's an important point to remember, this is the United States Department of Justice. This isn't some administrative agency nobody ever heard of. Um, all those federal prosecutors you see on TV, these are their colleagues, and they have all of the same power and authority and sense of entitlement uh, uh, that all those prosecutors have. So it's, it's just important to understand in terms of how the, the dynamics of these cases can unfold uh, at times. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so once a uh, charge uh, has filed, uh, the, charge, uh, the charging party uh, is uh, actually constrained from, from proceeding 
uh, on their own before what's called the Office of the Chief Administrative uh, Hearing Officer, which is an administrative tribunal within the Department of Justice that ultimately hears these cases uh, if they move forward without settlement. Um, that restraint, though, on the charging party, on that employee, uh, only lasts for 120 days. Uh, and at the conclusion of 120 days, uh, the uh, IR is, is presumed uh, to, uh, to, be, to need to have concluded its investigation. Uh, and at that point, the charging party uh, gains the right to go directly uh, in their own uh, before OCAHO. Uh, in fact, what happens as a practical matter uh, is that, uh, especially these days where, where IR is very busy, uh, the cases often take uh, past 120 days, at which point the uh, respondent will get a letter, uh, we call it the 120-day letter, uh, indicating to that respondent that the case is still open and also advising the charging party uh, of their right to go uh, before OCAHO. Um, generally, charging parties who are represented by counsel uh, will not elect uh, to proceed uh, to, to get ahead of IER. Uh, and we'll wait to see the IER outcome and take advantage of IER's expansive uh, investigative authorities uh, before that. Uh, but we have seen a couple of cases uh, where you do have um, uh, charging parties who go on their own, unrepresented, uh, before uh, OCAHO. Um, and let me just say those cases can be kind of wild. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, those, those end up being uh, very contentious cases. The charging parties, you know, uh, as you may imagine, don't necessarily know what they're doing, uh, but they can nonetheless be very litigious uh, in these types of cases. Uh, with respect to IER, during this period uh, after an investigation is initiated, uh, you can expect, and you'll see that we've italicized this here, you can re uh, expect requests for both uh, interviews uh, of individuals, as well as document production, uh, and it can happen in multiple rounds. Um, uh, they may uh, go through an initial round of interviews and document requests and then supplement uh, those requests uh, as the investigation uh, progresses. Um, IER may, at the end of its investigation, uh, among the things it may do, uh, is file a complaint for the Office of the Ch uh, Chief Administrative Hearing Officer. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to hear from Don and Angelo, but almost invariably, in my experience, before IER does that, uh, it makes a, uh, if it is determined that there has been a violation, it actually makes a, a settlement proposal uh, to, uh, and I think we're going to talk about settlements in a bit. Um, uh, also, to, uh, important to emphasize that the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, has uh, concurrent jurisdiction with OCAHO over national origin cases. And in fact, OCAHO will cede, uh, will stay its own case uh, and will cede, uh, cede the case to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, if, in fact, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has uh, uh, asserted jurisdiction over the case. Next slide, please. Uh, so here, so now you've gotten that charge, uh, 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 best practices. Uh, is it, uh, do you just plead guilty immediately, Dawn? Is that the uh, first step, just just cry uncle because you know you messed up or, or are, there, are there strategies to be undertaken here? Yeah, I think that's gonna be a last resort. I'm not saying that um, at the end of the day that may not be the route to go and, and, and we've done it, right, when, when we've had to. Um, but um, I would exhaust um, all other avenues, you know, before having to do that, because frankly, until you really understand the facts and you understand, um, you know, exactly what IAR is is, uh, is is asking or what the charging party is asking, um, you know, you may be you may be missing something. So these investigations really have to be handled with care. The problem is that you're often having um, there's often a conflict between the timing. Um, of, of trying to, um, you know, get through discovery and then um, the timing that IER wants things. In, in certain cases, they will be more reasonable than others, um, and they usually have their reasons um, for, you know, not allowing for certain extensions or allowing a, a production, but they want, you know, a certain request for information before others. 
Um, they generally like to, you know, keep things rolling. And of course, their own personal schedules in other cases, you know, may may um, may, may plan into the, and may, may figure into that. But I think um, oftentimes what we look at, especially if we're cleaning up a case that maybe came from somewhere else or had a company that was unrepresented, um, a lot of those issues stem from not really understanding, not you know, digging in and dig, digging deep to figure out what the particular issues were, and um, you know, just kind of looking on its face. Just because IAR is is alleging something, or because um, an employee, or, or because they've accepted a charge, doesn't necessarily mean it's true. And there could be a reason, and um, it could be that something may be true, but it may not be discrimination, right? So there could be a reason. Leon and I are constantly having these conversations along with Angelo, you know, what, what, you know, how, is, is, is this, you know was there really an impact? Um, so make sure that you're scheduling your interviews, looking at your data, and let me stop there with the data. IER, they, they can go through data, I think, um, at a faster pace and in, in, in more detailed, um, in, in my experience, than some of the other agencies, especially with ICE. Um, you know, whenever I have to compare, and Angela, you know, you mentioned, you know, how um, uh, I think you used the word overzealous the agency is. I, I always say, and I'll still say it, I'd rather go up against ICE anytime than IER. Um, it's, it's just, you know, the, the, the nature of the investigations. They know how to look at a spreadsheet. They know what they're looking for. They know how to target. And um, they know how to make a case, especially a pattern or practice case, you know, based on the data. So when you're responding and when you're handing over data, you know, to, to your counsel or directly to IER if you're unrepresented, which I would not recommend in any of these investigations, make sure you know what you're giving in um, and take a look at that and make sure it's accurate um, because it can come back to, you know, to haunt you later on. Stay ahead of it. Look at trends. Um, look to see, you know, Angela, you, you mentioned wh why, I think you said in, in uh, E-Verify, you know, why do we only have um, U.S. citizens or, or whatnot, or, or U.S. citizens only presenting a certain type of document. Sometimes I'll go through um, a database from, from E-Verify, and I will never see another document, you know, besides maybe three documents, or, or just I'll only see a driver's license and a Social Security card. And I'll go to the company and I'll say, Nobody ever presented anything else, and they'll say, well, no, because we tell them to bring their driver's license and their social security card, so, you know, that's what they bring. Yeah, I, I, could they present something else? I don't know, but that's what the, you know, that's what we were told. That's what, you know, Mary told us two years ago. So these are all the kind of things that we, you know, we need to, uh, uh, um, you know, to, to think about. Um, we were talking about, you know, creating a narrative um, and, and being careful and, and ensuring, you know, and maybe the word, I think, Angela, you called out, you know, creative, right? I, you, obviously, we're, 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 we're here to advocate on behalf of the company. We want to look beyond just the four corners of the, of the complaint and what the situation is. And that's what I mean by, you know, putting together the right narrative uh, for the defense. And obviously, again, not a one-size-fits-all. Um, but you really need to take that time to put the strategy together and, again, to say, I want to say one step ahead of the government, but to know what, what the issues are. There may come a time that you may need to make a voluntary disclosure, right? We, it, it may be appropriate. Um, put that litigation hold in place, and um, there's no reason why you can't start a remediation. If you recognize that you have a policy or a process that's wrong, you certainly can change it. You don't have to continue the, you know, either turning away somebody um, because of a document issue or whatnot. You can make that change, but make sure it's documented. If you are dealing with a, an issue on an I-9 or um, something with an electronic online vendor, you can certainly remediate, but make sure it's documented so that you can present it to the government and so that nothing looks like it was hidden in any way. I'm going to stop there and hear some comments from my co-panelists. Yeah, so, so I, I would just suggest, I'll go, go ahead, Leon. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was just going to suggest that sometimes the narrative is very difficult to fashion because um, the regulations uh, were changed uh, in late 2016, early 2017, uh, and, and Leon earlier quoted the section of the law uh, on the definition of discrimination, and so animus or hostility uh, is not uh, required to be proven by IER. So a, a poorly trained employee, an HR recruiter, 
or uh, an HR representative when preparing the I-9 with the employee present um, uh, may think they're doing the right thing. They may think they're being helpful, but in the commentary to the final rule, the agency, in fact, uh, um, acknowledged that uh, uh, essentially no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, and, and so I would just urge you to take a look at, at that issue if you're facing that kind of a question where a well-intentioned action had the effect of um, constituting discrimination under that definition. Uh, because, frankly, the, the regulation does not track the earlier uh, Okaho decisions, which said that there had to be a willfulness or an intention to violate someone's rights, not merely an, an oops. And, and so that's one point I would add. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we talked about how uh, one way an investigation can, can conclude, and that is with the actual uh, finding of a charge. There are also uh, many cases in which IER uh, finds insufficient evidence of violation, uh, or uh, while finding that there was a violation or a possible violation uh, determines uh, that there are equities that mitigate against filing uh, charges that uh, that used to happen quite a bit more in the past. Uh, that is pretty rare uh, these days. Um, uh, if um, uh, IER determines that there has been a violation, uh, again, its MO is almost always uh, to offer uh, a settlement. Um, that settlement um, does not require uh, the involved employer to admit or deny liability. Uh, but it will generally include civil monetary penalties. Uh, it will include a payment of back wages, uh, certainly to the charging party if they lost employment uh, in some degree because of the, uh, of, of the practice deemed to have been discriminatory. Uh, but at times, uh, there even can be a fund uh, to compensate other potential victims uh, of that, uh, uh, pra that, that uh, practice found to have been discriminatory. Uh, there will also be uh, training and education requirements, uh, uh, notices that will need to be posted at the employer's work site, which you should be doing anyway, uh, reporting uh, and monitoring, uh, periodic reporting and monitoring uh, over the uh, life of the agreement, which could be either two to three years. Uh, and then this is a big one for a lot of our clients. Uh, there is a press release. Uh, and um, let, let me just say that um, one a important strategic consideration as the investigation unfold uh, is that it is very possible to end up with a, a congratulatory press release from the Department of Justice uh, where they commend the employer on their uh, proactive steps to remediate their noncompliance, to cooperate with the Department of Justice, Justice's investigation. And those look a whole lot better uh, than the ones where uh, you fought tooth and nail and they still find a violation. Uh, and um, um, though they're, 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 they, you really can affect how your, how your employer, uh, you as an employer or your client as an employer looks. Uh, by how you manage the investigation. Uh, there's also uh, issues, potential issues of suspension or debarment uh, for federal contractors. Um, certainly before we ever advise a client to settle who is a federal contractor, uh, we, we evaluate uh, and ask them to evaluate um, the, um, wh whether there is a real potential for that to occur. It, it actually is rare, but it can occur. It is something to be careful about. Uh, if there thing, is no uh, settlement. Le yeah. Leon, I would note is that there's sort of a, a, a an oxymoron in the first two bullet points there. Employer neither admits nor denies liability, but then agrees to pay a penalty. And the word penalty usually connotes some sort of wrongdoing. Um, and, and that's why I think you want to be very careful that that um, neither admission nor denial is is in the agreement because maybe that will be the way that you can defend against yeah. uh, a claim of suspension or debarment because uh, there really isn't a finding of liability. There's an allegation in the settlement agreement of of a violation, but that no, doesn't mean that it was and, established. 
and the way the agreements are phrased these days, that that does not actually have that language. It just is. It is. Uh, there, there is no statement by the employer saying I neither admit nor deny nor uh, uh, anything implicit from uh, IER. Rather, there's just a recitation about what IER thinks might have occurred uh, without there being any actual uh, admission by the employer. Uh, all right, why don't we move on to the next slide? I think we have our uh, what the penalties could be uh, here. Dawn, anything we want to say about this or, or do they speak for themselves? Four digits and five digits uh, okay, they, per, per charge. <laughs> exactly. They speak for themselves. And, and like you said, a lot of it is the branding, it's the monitoring, um, you know, it's having IR in your business for some amount of time afterwards. And, um, you know, it, it's that press release. It's, it, it's a lot. So, yeah, we can move to the next slide and we'll share this. Keep going. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, typical, some typical scenarios. Um, uh, they're, we're going to be talking about three sort of broad categories of IER cases that we typically see. Uh, probably the most common investigations we see are unfair documentary practices investigations. Uh, they could be cases where an employer uh, either requires specific documentation, even though the employee may have a choice among different documentation that they may present, uh, requiring more documentation than required by the I-9. So requiring a green card, a driver's license, and a social security number, even though they only need to have uh, uh, presented uh, one, either you know, a green card or the combination of the driver's license and social security. Um, how, do, how, does, how does an employer avoid uh, uh, getting into these kinds of scenarios, Dawn and, and Angela? What, and, what, what, what should we uh, advise folks here? Yeah, I think it's well, important to uh, sure that you go. Sorry, I, I'll quickly go through. I was through. just going to say, that, I mean, training, 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 um, because many of these uh, errors can be avoided with uh, proper training so that an employer's representative knows how to phrase, uh, they know how to phrase the uh, the ask of the employee when the I-9 is being done. They know how to phrase their recruitment efforts so that there is not some blunder by saying green card or U.S. citizen preferred or only in the ads. Um, it's a little more subtle with the electronic I-9 systems, and I know this is one of your favorite topics, Dawn, so why don't you turn to that one? Sure. So when you get to the electronic I-9 systems and also other onboarding systems and whatnot, um, the system itself could be configured in a way either by you folks at the company or by the vendor where certain documents are being requested or forced, um, and you may not realize it. Um, so it is important not to just blindly um, accept that your vendor is compliant. There, you know, we have we have electronic I-9 regulations, um, which I, I think on a not even a weekly, on a daily basis, I speak to companies. To, that don't realize that there should be diligence of a system before selecting it. And just because it's a name brand does not mean uh, that it's a, uh, a compliance system. So you need to look at those things and, and ensure that your system is not forcing. Um, next slide. Um, so the... Um uh, one one major area and one where, where there's actually been some stepped up enforcement over the last three or four years by IER uh, are in cases where uh, government contractors or other kinds of regulated uh, companies uh, impose uh, citizenship status uh, requirements on employees where those are not exactly supported by the law. Uh, and, and what occurs here uh, really is one of two things. One is uh, employers who misinterpret uh, a law that perhaps requires clearance for certain types of individuals, uh, as opposed to being an outright uh, prohibition on employment, uh, or employers uh, who deem the process of seeking clearance, uh, typically in the form of, a, of, a, of an export license, uh, find it too burdensome uh, for whatever reason, and then move ahead uh, to deny certain categories of either nationals or particular countries uh, or non-citizens uh, employment. So this is an area where if you are either a government contractor uh, or subject to the international trafficking and arms regulation or export administration regulations, you do need to have some care. 
Uh, Dawn, anything to add on this point? Yeah, I think um, two things. One, people misunderstand um, the contract reads U.S. persons, not U.S. citizens. And people often read, they see U.S. persons, but they read it as U.S. citizens. So I think that's a big issue. When we kind of dig in, I always say, can you go back and look at the contract? We haven't seen the contract. Oh, it, it may be a U.S. citizen, um, but it could be a U.S. person, which would be a U.S. citizen, a non-citizen national, a lawful permanent resident, uh, an asylum or refugee. And those people, you know, may be fine on, under the contract. Um, so it is important to, to do that. Um, and, and, and again, it's not just ITAR, it's, it's all sorts of regulated industries. Um, sometimes the line gets blurred be, between the regulations of the, the agencies that you're dealing with and um, what the actual requirements are. So the biggest, you know, I, I think um, advice here is to make sure that if you are in a regulated industry, that whatever you are doing for that is separate and apart from the work authorization process. Because keep in mind, um, if it's done you know, during onboarding, it's part and parcel. Onboarding pursuant to the, the, the 2016 reg, it's part of hiring, and IER has said they have jurisdiction over this, and they, you know, they were challenged on that, and they said, yeah, we're not changing it. So um, separate that process out um, and make sure that um, there's a clear delineation, and I, I think that's, you know, one way um, to, uh, uh, you know, to avoid that. And there are some, um, some TALs specifically on, on, on these export. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, and uh, it, here, uh, there, there, this has actually been an area of priority under, at DOJ, both under Republican and Democratic leadership, uh, and that is cases where there are allegations or the actuality of, in some cases, uh, preferences uh, um, for uh, sponsored workers uh, to the detriment of uh, U.S. workers, be they uh, uh, legal permanent residents, F refugees, asylees, or U.S. citizens. Um, and often uh, the issues here go in tandem uh, with uh, potential exposure uh, to both Department of Labor and Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, this is a complex area, uh, uh, so something we could discuss in and of itself for about an hour. Uh, but the one the one thing I think is an important point to underscore here, just because you are complying with Department of Labor regulations related to labor certification does not rescue you uh, from the potential uh, for a charge of discrimination uh, 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 based on one of these uh, theories. Uh, since we're getting close to the bottom of the hour, let me just give everybody the continuing legal education code. That is uh, S as in Seifarth, S as in Shaw, 8423. Again, SS8423. Uh, next slide, please. Just one, one thing on, on, on um, the, sorry, on, on the, uh, um, you know, those, those types of cases. Um, I, I do think, well, you know, let's go on. We'll, we'll, we'll sit here. Go ahead. Yep. So, Dawn, I think I'm going to turn over to you. There's a there's a bunch of examples here that our participants will be able to look at. Uh, maybe there's a couple that you might like to highlight before we reach the end of the hour. Sure. Um, th th this citizenship uh, status. Um, th this is from a most recent settlement um, that now is up to 20 different employers. The highlight here of this particular group of cases. Um, we had um, a, a college recruiting platform that was being used by employers, and the bottom line here is that the system itself had some sort of defect that basically deterred uh, certain types of um, non-U.S. citizens from applying or being passed through the process. They were, they were blocked out. Um, and instead of IAR going to the college directly, they, they went through all of the employers um, that were using the system. So again, beware on these electronic systems, the onboarding. It's, you can't, your, your HR folks, your payroll folks should not be just selecting a system without diligencing it. And um, at the end of the day, you're, you, know, you as the company are going to be responsible, not the vendor itself. Um, next slide. Uh, and let, oh, let me ahead. just under, underscore that. 
that point because the selection of electronic uh, vendor, uh, both in recruiting platforms and in uh, electronic I-9 platforms, it is something that should be done with great care. Not only are there issues associated with data security, but sometimes, as was found with an earlier uh, series of enforcement actions dealing with a medical specialty, uh, the, the, uh, the questionnaire that was posed um, asked the wrong question what was printed looked like it was an innocent, accurate answer. But um, so you have to really look under the hood, as Dawn was saying, and negotiate the indemnification clauses in those kinds of agreements. And, you know, just going back, because we're, we're at the hour, um, we're going to circulate these slides that just highlighted some of the recent, recent cases. Um, important to take a look at what questions can be asked. Um, our own Angelo Paparelli has a core um, technical assistant letter, TAL, where um, he um, basically had um, IER, um, I'll call it bless, uh, some of the core questions that can be asked on an application in terms of whether or not someone is authorized to work in the United States, whether or not they need sponsorship, and then how sponsorship is defined. We are now kind of morphing Angelo's TAL and kind of, you know, pushing that a little bit further, bringing it, you know, into 2000 and 2022, talking about immigration support and whatnot. Um, it's a big area, and um, it is something that, you know, that we're going to be following up on. Um, I don't know if anyone has any last words, but we will circulate these slides. Well, I, I will just say immigration support, as you say, has morphed. And so filling out a, a training program for a STEM That's student right. is exactly one right. area that is could be defined as a kind of sponsorship. Uh, similarly, the adjustment of status portability form, the I-485 Supplement J, could be seen as a kind of immigration sponsorship, and those were not presented in the earlier request that I posed that led to the technical assistance letter. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that this is a, this particular area is one where uh, DOJ and IER specifically really tried to condition behavior. Uh, in ways that I actually um, um, am not sure the law ultimately support, and they haven't really come forward with a whole bunch of enforcement actions in this area, uh, but it is an area that causes a tremendous uh, amount of anxiety for our, uh, for our clients uh, who are trying to avoid the burdens of sponsoring where they really don't want to. Um, or, or being, or, or having employees uh, come and work for them for four months and then say, you know, my visa is done, I can't work for you anymore. Um, and, and so this is an area where we really do try to work with our clients to, to make sure they get the answers that they need to be able to make sound hiring decisions without necessarily uh, ending up in, in the trick bag, as it were, with, uh, with IER. Exactly. I, I, I think at the end of the day, we have to be prepared. I mean, we want to cooperate with the IER. We want to be reasonable. But if we have to challenge, we will certainly challenge. Um, and um, I think that, you know, being proactive in your communications and your strategy and whatnot is super important. Um, and this, this is an area that, that's morphing. It's an area to watch. Um, take, take these DOJ IER complaints very seriously, whether or not they're interventions um, or if they are um, charges. But thank you, everyone, for, for joining us, um, and we'll see you next time in our next uh, installment of this series.